Okay, Dr. Jones, we are live. Awesome. I am ready to go. This is gonna be a phenomenal evening of talking about something that's really important in our STEM forward effort. We've been at this for several months and we are truly committed to putting out there the value and importance of science, technology, engineering, and math, and to let everyone know that you can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, indeed. Um, I'm Dr. John W. Spencer. I'm joined with Dr. Stephen Jones. As you said, this is STEM Forward. And this week we're going to talk about, or this month we're going to talk about saving the planet. You know, everybody talks about going green, green jobs, the Green New Deal. It was a lot going on in the election. But, you know, Dr. Jones, what, what, is, what is that? You know, when they talk about green jobs and, and saving the planet, you know, what, what can our K-12 students do in terms of saving the planet or even careers that are about saving the planet? Well, we're, we're going to dig deep into this, but there's so many new opportunities around solar panels that go into homes and industry and there's uh, wind energy. And we're talking about alternative types of energy that will help us to make it through the next century. And to one of the things that's happened always as uh, those of us who live in America, we've seen all the innovation and we're at the very beginning of the innovation and energy and a sustainability that we're gonna do to keep all of our homes well lit and to ensure that we're successfully uh, engaging as a country with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I thought about as we were getting ready for tonight's stream is um, in the late 80s, early 90s, when I was a teenager finishing high school, going into college, you know, they discovered a hole in the ozone. And so because of that hole in the ozone, they understood that chlorofluorocarbons caused the hole in the ozone. And that was the main chemical that was used for refrigeration and air conditioning in homes and cars. And it's banned throughout the world. I mean, right. there was no debate about mm -hmm. the science mm -hmm. that this man-made chemical was harming us and, and you had to get rid of it to stop the hole in the ozone. But now, you know, it's all this debate. You know, some people are saying climate deniers are saying that the science just isn't there. The science was there 30 years ago for us to, you know, figure something out and understand that we had to ban this substance or we wouldn't have anything protecting us from the sun's radiation. So when, when you think about how to get the required K-12 to education in terms of saving planet, you know, what, what are some of the things in terms of math, science, and engineering, business, or computer courses can uh, K-12 to students or can K-12 students do in school or with their parents? You know, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the curriculum because I was thinking about uh, a lot of times when we think of computer science, we're only thinking about programming. But there's a whole area of computer science that's also managing our environment, that's managing the technology that creates new resources, that ensures that we're that things are safe, whatever it is, whether it's the electric grid or it's other forms of energy that could potentially be explosive in this country. They it's protecting us. So computer science is absolutely a course that I think I think all high schools should have a computer science class and that all students should have exposure to computer science. Mm -hmm. Certainly uh, in the areas of, of um, math and physics, um, biology, chemistry, all those kinds of courses that are in the sciences really will help a student to have the critical thinking abilities that will help them to be successful if they wanna go further into the sciences or into engineering when they're in college. So it, it, there's really a foundation and one of those foundations for all of this is mathematics. We talk about pre-calculus and calculus. And I want to say this while we're having this conversation is that if your high school doesn't offer a pre-calculus or calculus course, very often the high schools will provide you with an opportunity to send your child to a community college and take the courses that are not offered at their school. So I encourage parents to take advantage of that so that their young people can stay in line with where they need to be to go into these areas of technology. 
You know, one of the things that I, I thought about when you were saying that, uh, I participated, I think Gallup, one of the national um, polling companies last year, mm -hmm. um, I participated in one of their surveys. And one of the things that I think we have to look at in K-12 education, right now the four core courses are um, English language arts, social studies, math, and science. I think we need to add a fifth. I think computer science and logic has to be taught from K through 12th grade, because when I think about things like farming, for example, if you ever go to a large farm, you'll see these um, huge, um, for lack of a better term, water sprinklers, but those mm -hmm. are programmed. Right, right. You know, somebody actually has to program the sprinkler to tell it how long to run, um, mm -hmm. you know, how much water to, you know, to put out over the um, crops and things like that. Many, many, many of the, uh, the farm equipment and many of the things that we use in lightweight manufacturing and other things have a computer that run it. You know, mm -hmm. when I go to my cousin's auto shop, you know, he probably has just as many computer related devices that have to be programmed um, as regular tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when, when I think about like math K to 12, one of the things I would say to parents, you have to have your children harp on things like we call math facts. One of the things that I've noticed a lot of children cannot do, they don't know their time table by heart. They don't know zero to 12. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it hard for them to do um, three and four digit multiplication. They don't understand base 10. So one of the things that you might want to do with your children is practice the timetable. You, you can download flashcards online mm -hmm. because you, to, to get into some of this advanced math, some of the um, rudimentary math, you need to know cold. Mm -hmm. And part of that is memorization. Before you could talk about you know, how you solve the problem, you, you have to be able to solve it. You, you have to know, um, if, if I think about, let's say, K to four, K to three, um, being able to add three and four digit numbers and to have the automaticity, you know, that, that children know how to carry different numbers uh, to get the right answer and to keep it in its lanes and things of that nature. You know, th those are things that are very important to move them forward into a STEM uh, courses or STEM career. And, and the parents, you can have a lot of fun in, by, just by having math conversations with your child, whether it's you're making... Uh, you're baking a cake at home, you're measuring how much flour you're putting in the cup. Uh, what is a half? What is a fourth? What is three fourths? What does it look like? So that when you're you're measuring things, young people get to see what it actually looks like and they can estimate, well, this doesn't make any sense if they're saying as a foot, that looks more like six inches. I mean, like I've done that so much that I know what it looks like. And what we ought to be doing is encouraging uh, parents to be a major role and the enthusiasm around math and science and this whole idea of saving um, saving uh, the planet is really important. And one of the subjects that, again, I think need to be in our high schools is some kind of environmental studies mm -hmm. I mean, that may be tied to the sciences, but understanding the importance of environment. And I think it's so critical today because our children spend so much time inside rather than outside in the environment. We used to, when we grew up, we spent, you know, our, our parents had to come and call us to get back in the house. Or or, or we knew that when the light came on, we were supposed to go back. Into uh, Steve, let me ask you something. Did your mom ever tell you smell like outside? Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yes. Yeah, that, that, that's how much time we spend um, outside. Like, like one of the small things that I do with my children when we go to the store, depending on what it is, I won't ask for a bag because mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want that plastic bag. If you look at the amount of pollution that's in the ocean right now of plastic, mm -hmm. one of the things, and, and this is nothing but engineering and creative thought. You know, I've watched these engineers the last couple of years develop these uh, machines, whether they're boats or like robots that go out there and skim the plastic off mm -hmm. the top of the oceans because I think you can go on Google Earth and see the big trash swirl in the uh, Pacific Ocean. Right, and, right. And so we're going to need people to go into different careers to make sure that we have 
oceans that can support life. Because if we don't have oceans that support that can support life, that's a trickle down effect that that'd be catastrophic for humans. Right. And with over seven, eight, or nine billion people on the earth, mm -hmm. we won't have enough fresh water and other resources. So we need individuals that can really work with the environment to make it operate at its optimum uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I was thinking about I was reading down here, because we have some things that we want to make sure we ask tonight, is that we need more people to be out there um, tutoring and helping young people to understand these areas of math and science and to be resources. Many, uh, many children never even see a tutor until they get to college. That's the first time that they're having experience with a tutor. But all throughout the child's educational experience, it is a good thing for you to find that tutor, whether it's a teacher or someone from the outside that's a professional that will help your child to understand things from a different perspective. I think that that's, if we're gonna do math and science, you might need that kind of help to get through the challenges of it. Mm -hmm. um, and and to make the transition from elementary school to middle school and middle school to high school. I think it's really important to have that kind of support in place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to go along with tutoring, there's also volunteer opportunities. I know things are hard now with COVID and, you know, having to stay at home more and things like that. But, you know, there, there's plenty of um, activities that you can do at home with your children. Because think about it, a lot of people are ordering stuff. You know, Amazon has made like a gazillion dollars since the beginning of uh, the pandemic. And so you have all these brown boxes. What are you going to do with them? Right. You know, one of the things that I would suggest to you, break down those uh, cardboard boxes. And there's all types of design projects online that you can do with your children. I mean, mm -hmm. you can make a box robot. You can make a box car. There's so many things that you can do um, at home with your children with, with things around the house. And, you know, that'll be some, you know, when we put up this uh, the stream on our website at stemforwardedu.org, we'll, we'll have some activities that you can do with your children at home. But that, that's a great way to introduce children to science, to engineering, and then show them how math is in their everyday life. Exactly. And one of the things I wanted that people don't really realize is that there are a lot of environmental centers all around. Like here in Philadelphia, we have one that's um, it's it's really off of 63rd Street, Cobbs Creek Parkway. They actually have an environmental center that you can go there. You can go on tours. We have environmental centers in our parks in various places. Um, there's an environmental center that's out in the southwest. Um, there's a like a natural preserve. You, if you start begin start to begin to have those kind of experiences where you're taking your child out to actually visually see things, and even though we're in COVID, um, there still may be some places because it's outside that you can go with just you and another child and actually have a wonderful experience. I know um, at the the Cox Creek Environmental Center, they also have had young people to give tours and to mm -hmm. have discussions about what they're seeing. I think the more that you live in it and see it, the more that you appreciate it. And, and many of those organizations, um, because I am a still a principal full time, have moved many of those activities uh, virtually. And mm -hmm. so you can get a digital tour of the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you're a teacher looking for different things to do with your students, you can use Google tour via Google Earth to expose them to different things. So say you want to show them the, tr the trash swirl in the Pacific Ocean, you can find it on Google Earth mm -hmm. and you have a conversation of what can we do as individuals to reduce our carbon footprint, the, the amount of uh, plastic and trash that, that we release into the environment. Now, one of the things that, so my, I'm going to brag a little bit here on my daughter, she's uh, working her doctor degree and one of the things that she's been talking about is how do we create opportunities through maker spaces mm -hmm. that allows young people to use their creativity. And we talk about the swirl, you know, you could actually do experiments in a maker space in terms of what are some different types of things that we might be able to do to remove these things from the ocean. The maker spaces are kind of large environments where you, you might have 
um, different types of resources to build and create and to get students thinking. And I think that makes education, students will run to school if they have experiences where they can engage with their hands and in their mind and then, you know, in the reading of it and understanding of it and developing it. So I think that's really important. So let, let, let's talk about that um, a little bit more, because I think there might be some people that are watching this and will watch this that don't understand what a maker space is. Yes. I, I'll tell it from, from a K to 12 perspective. Um, in most schools, you have you have stationary computer labs. If, if you're in a K to eight school, you might have all Macs. If you're a high school, you may have one Mac lab and you may have one PC lab. And so what I've what I've done as a principal um, over the last decade, I have discontinued my labs. So, like, for example, in the school where I am now, um, we have developed a makerspace. We broke down the old lab. Mm -hmm. I brought actually the, the sprocket tables that have whiteboard tops so students can work out problems. In that space, you'll have Macs, you'll have Chromebooks, and you will have PCs. So children get to work on all three dominant operating systems. We also have a 3D printer. We have a large-scale plotting printer. We have various programmable robots like Ozobots and things of that nature. But like, like Dr. Jones was saying, it's a, it's a space in which children can show their creativity. I don't want students to just know how to work word processing programs or office productivity tools like Microsoft 365. Mm -hmm. I want children to actually can be creative. And so having those different types of computers, having the 3D printer and the large scale plotting printer um, and we have a few other things in there to make, you know, so if they dream up something, they can actually make it. Mm -hmm. you know? And then in the front of the room is a big 70 inch interactive whiteboard, you know, so, so the teacher can show different things. So that, that's what a maker space. But, but if you think about it in terms of small business and, and after high school, um, creating environments where, where people can maybe rent space or go to try out an idea. Um, when I think of it, like, for example, if you're a caterer, you can rent kitchen space to work on something, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's, it's the same concept to have. Maybe you'll have a, um, a laser printer or something like that. Like, I don't know if people have seen this commercial for the Forge printer that does laser printing or it, it cuts cardboard and wood and things like that. It's about five to ten thousand dollars. But, you know, that can be an investment to a small business. But mm -hmm. or if there was a maker space that had that laser cutter, you know, which fits on a, a t you know, not too big table. You know, people can come in, try out one of their ideas, make a prototype or something mm -hmm. uh, of their idea um, to secure uh, more funding or additional funding. Yeah. And, and what, what we're really talking about here, as I think about the conversation, is entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. We want again, to encourage young people that you can start your own businesses in these areas, whether in the environmental area. One of the things I'm always challenged by is um, the fact that a lot of these, a lot of jobs that are created or new jobs are created are in the hands of the same people. We need everyone to take advantage of this opportunity. This is like the, the, the fledgling aspect of developing these types of resources that will help to make the future better for everyone. Uh, so we're gonna go into the next segment, which is also talking about my, my, one of my famous uh, and, and exciting areas is college and college training and preparation. I got so excited about it. Um, when I talk about students going from K to 12 and then taking the next leap into college, but it's really important that you have the foundational skills so that when you go over to the college environment, you can be successful. And one of the, the areas that students often find out um, that their high school preparation wasn't as in depth as it needed to be when they got to college. And so I say to you, make sure if you're interested in these sciences, make sure that you have the physics and the calculus, but there's also um, another type of course that you can take take and that's the advanced placement class and that's for uh, high school students that want to take a higher level math or higher level even english or history but ap 
um, then at the end of the year, you actually take a test. And if you get a four or five on that, you actually get the credits toward college. And you can use those to then um, either shorten the amount of time that you're in college or you might want to minor in something, you have more flexibility. And you want to take these courses and, and some of the colleges, well, I will say this also, some of the colleges will offer you an opportunity to take a test before you start your math course or your chemistry course. And I think it's good if you can do that because it will ensure that you're getting into the math class at the right level, as opposed to stepping into something that first semester that will really be too difficult for you. So if a college actually offers that opportunity, or as we're doing this next semester at our university, we're actually having um, like math classes prior to the math class. So they're setting up students for success. It may seem like you're getting additional work, but that additional work is going to prepare you. And you want to be well prepared to uh, manage through the, the difficult and challenging curriculum. You know, and, and that makes me think when I talk to K to 12 parents to get them ready for that. School may end in June, but learning doesn't. Mm. You know, th those those two and a half, three months that you have in the summer. Yes, you can make it fun, but you want to be very wary of summer slide. If you know your child has certain ambitions, you want to give them opportunities. Or mm -hmm. like um, Dr. Jones talked about earlier, when it comes to tutoring, if you know they're having difficulty, they can't afford to have three months off without you know keeping that math, that science and different things, that reading comprehension vocabulary, you know, they, they can't have that summer slide because if, if you want them to have opportunity um, for high school selection and then college acceptance, learning is a 12 month process. Exactly. Yeah. Let me ask you this question. If I remember correctly, when you you attended Morgan University yeah, mm -hmm. and um, you were in the sciences, yeah, my first degree is in biology from Morgan State University. Right. So so tell us what that experience was like, because a lot of times you know, when parents are sending their children off to college and different types of majors, they don't understand what the experience is going to be like. So, so tell me what maybe the first year was like, the adjustments that you might have had to make and what resources you took advantage of. But, but Steve, to go to your point, it didn't start my first year of college. Mm -hmm. my, my father, my mother and father recognized early that I liked science. Mm -hmm. And when, when summer, you know, started, I thought I'd be on the block with my friends, riding my bikes, doing whatever. No, I had to go to some sort of science camp or something. Mm -hmm. And they recognized it in me, but I didn't recognize it in myself until seventh grade. And so I had a high school biology course where I was dissecting animals. So I say, oh, you know, I, I do want to do this. And so all through high school, especially in the summer, I went to um, different universities to have science exp uh, experiences that would prepare me um, for college. So going to Morgan, being a biology major, I couldn't play around. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was a major where I constantly had to study. I was just explaining to my daughter who was in the college application process is that I had a study team. You know, when you're taking organic chemistry, you're yeah. taking physics, <laughs> yeah. uh, molecular cellular biology and things like that. You have a study team. It is a group effort, you know, because th there is so much content that you have to memorize and to think about it and talk coherently about um, that. If you don't know how to, to study, yeah, to retain information. And to, to write about it, I, I was explaining to somebody last week, when I got to college, I never had a multiple choice test again. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to explain the concepts and talk about, you know, I had to work out the problem that they were presenting me. Mm -hmm. you know, um, in genetics, we had to do this process called electrophoresis and things like that. Uh, learn how to use an autoclave machine to sterilize, you know, scientific instruments and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it was, a um, and I also, I went to summer school every summer because mm -hmm. it's not just something where you get 120 credits in and you graduate. I mean, there's always more coursework um, that you can do. So it was a very rigorous um, 
four years. And and was was the lab experience the first time you had that? Did you have some lab experiences so, while in high school? Right. So going to those science programs actually got to work in some very advanced laboratories as a teenager. So when I would have a two to three hour chemistry lab or a two to three hour biology lab, I was used to it. I hmm. understood, you know, what it took in terms of developing lab notes and to um, to handle the expectations of the teacher and to finish the experiments or the different things that they wanted us to learn in lab. So you, you brought up such a, a wonderful point about these programs because I we did do that with our children as well. And I think it's really important in terms of also the adjustment to what is college going to be like. If you actually are participating in those summer programs, it gives you a great opportunity to adjust to that type of experience and the experience of being away from home. It also gives the opportunity for a student to do that as well. Um, one of the things that uh, students often uncover through these summer programs where their real interest lies. They may not get these type of experiences while they're in their normal academic year as a high school student, but having these summer experiences are now um, giving them an opportunity to really explore at a deeper level. I actually have two programs at Villanova University. One is a Saturday program where I encourage students to understand engineering. They actually, well, this year is, is virtual, but typically, they would come from the Philadelphia area and they spend seven Saturdays on our campus from nine to two thirty, all developing all kinds of engineering projects. We program drones and robots and build bridges and uh, watch viruses uh, uh, produce and produce. Uh, so we, we give them different types of experiences while they're in high school and this program in particular the, the young person can come back for four years. So if they come in ninth grade, they can continue with us all through four years. And then I have a summer program where young people can come and spend a week on campus. Again, this past summer was online, but prayerfully next summer, it will be an opportunity for individuals to come and live on campus and explore at a deeper level. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what do you think are some of the majors that an, an individual that's interested in environment uh, might particularly go into? Well, I mean, one, you could just go into straight biology. Um, mm -hmm. There's environmental science, there's marine biology. So, so there's all types of courses. One of the things I like that my university would do, um, every freshman that came in, they handed us a sheet. It was like a collage of all the careers you could do in a biology degree. Oh. You know, it didn't just mean... Um, working in the lab. I mean, I had one experience uh, in high school and, and this is what I try to emulate to my students where I got to stand in a, uh, I think a bio level four or five lab, you know, where they work on diseases like the Hunter virus, Ebola and things like that. I got to stand at the bottom of a cooling tower at a nuclear power plant. I got to see the PJM, let me see, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland interconnect, you mm -hmm. know, which which is the hub of electricity for like the East Coast. No. You know, but if I wasn't in those programs, I couldn't see that. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got to college, being in that environment and being like having to go to the lab, you know, the, the, the professor demonstrates, you know, what you're supposed to do, and then you have to emulate it. I wasn't intimidated going into that setting. So as a principal, I try to make sure that my students have enough experiences outside of the walls of the school. So when they're presented with different opportunities, they can take advantage of it. But th th there are all types of slices, I'll say, of you know, a core biology um, program of study at the university setting that, that people can go into. There's so many nuances of biology, chemistry, engineering, physics, and things like that. Yeah, I, I wanna talk about the rounded experience that a college student goes through. And mm -hmm. I think it's important as well. Even though, you know, because you're going into biology or chemistry or engineering, that you have a passion about that, you're still gonna take English classes, 
you're still going to take writing places, uh, courses where you'll have to write on different topics, sociology, maybe psychology. Um, you still will have those elective classes to take. And you want to maximize those experiences because you never know what the conversations that you might end in. And I was just thinking about my son is in the finance industry, but I'm certain that he's dealing with different types of companies that are in all kinds of businesses, whether it's environmental businesses or it's uh, other finance companies, but you're developing this knowledge and this skill set so you can operate in all kinds of different places. Uh, college is a place where you're expanding your mind and your ability to problem solve and to make good decisions. So I think that that's really important that even if you're, you have a son or a daughter that's going to a different type of major. Maybe the major is communications. Well, they could be work in, working in communications in an environmental company. And so they'll have to have some basic knowledge of biology and chemistry to go into that conversation. That's mm -hmm. why it's important to have that well-rounded college experience. So one of the things that maybe most people don't even think of or know about, many of the patents in the last 30 years of technology have been around algorithms for the financial sector. Mm -hmm. Many of, um, a lot of programming ha handle or revolves around the financial markets, you know? So right now, so the stock market is worldwide, it's globally connected and it's 24 seven, 365, but that is the development of, of te uh, networking technology, the, um, the proliferation of fiber optics and, and high speed networks and cloud computing. And that, that all comes out of engineering, computer engineering mm -hmm. and, and things of that nature. Yeah, and, and by, by expanding your knowledge and expanding your network, you're gonna create more opportunities for yourself. Today is kind of different in terms of just employment in any industry. The average person is working three to five years in a given industry. And so is the inner, the uh, industries are changing over those three to five years. So you have to continually educate yourself and find ways to keep up. And one of the ways that our students do that while they're in college is that they, they participate in volunteerism activities. We send students to Africa. We send students to South America. We send students all around the world to address environmental issues, whether it's pollution, whether it's a lack of water, whether it's a lack of energy in certain places, whether it's a lack of access to um, wireless technology. We are sending students around the world to address these issues. And what, what we need to do is continue to, to give our students exposure. And that's what we try to do as a university, make sure they have these different types of exposure that's gonna have them in a position that wherever they work, whether it's a company in America or it's a company in another country, they can make the adjustment. And I will say that the environments may be different, but the ability to communicate and problem solve and decision make are still important no matter where you go. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things, I, I'm a big sci-fi person. So I, I love Star Wars, Star Trek, things of that nature. And I believe that movies and television, one of the things that, that they try to do is to make us comfortable with things. And so as we become more technologically advanced, um, so comes the need for people that can do things. If you think about, and we've talked about this quite a bit with COVID, one of the things that COVID has exposed is that many people are just consumers of technology. They mm -hmm. really don't know what to do with it. That they don't know how to actually develop and produce things. You know that that has been a big issue in, in K to twelve schools. You know you would hear most teachers and most principals, say, but the children know how to use technology. They have their phones. They're always on computers. No, they use it for social media and for video. I mean, you have a few that really know how to manipulate multimedia and things of that nature. But when it came to actually using certain productivity tools mm -hmm. to uh, deliver uh projects and things like that to show what they've learned and to show what they've mastered or to study they've had a lot of difficulty so i i know in, in my particular school we had to retrain our teachers you know mm -hmm. how to deliver engaging instruction but we're mm -hmm. also having 
to train the students to work more independently, you know, and then that, that's a balance because in the classroom, the teacher is always near. You, know, right. you can always ask a question, but as they move into post-secondary education, whether it's, it's a, a diploma program or a four-year college, the ability to work on projects independently, the ability to use a variety of whether it's software or tools to develop a project at a deliverable for a class, you know, that actually might be one of the advantages that COVID gives our children at this time. Mm -hmm. And and they'll be willing to do things that others hadn't done before because they've had this exposure early on. Uh, typically, a lot of students coming from the K-12 experience have memorized, but they haven't learned how to apply that knowledge to something. And I find, especially that first year, when they start getting these tests, where they have to apply knowledge, they don't know how to do it because they've never done it before. Not that they can't do it, it's just they haven't been exposed to how you take a formula and then apply it to a given situation. So mm -hmm. I think what you're doing is wonderful. That's just, that's awesome that you're giving that experience to them early on. And then what it will do also is give them confidence that they can do uh, those types of problems and solve those type of problems on their own. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next segment that we're going to get into uh, this evening, which is really important, is after you've done all this, you've gone through K-12, you did the hard sciences, you went to college, and you had the great experience. Well, now we need to know, what are some of the careers in this industry uh, of saving the planet? What are some of the things that we could be doing? So um, what, do you, what do you have to say about solar, the solar industry? And what are the other kinds of jobs that when you think of solar industry, you probably think of one thing, but are there other kinds of things that the solar industry uh, might influence? There, there's so many things in terms of solar energy that can be done in, in, in terms of jobs. But as America, we're really lagging behind China in terms of development. Uh, our, our dependency on, on fossil fuel and that industry has really pushed us back. Like for example, about four years ago, maybe five years ago, Tesla actually invented a solar roofing shingle. Now just imagine that as, as a roofing company. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not just about tar and paper anymore and a nail gun. It's about connecting those individual solar shingles into the power grid of that house. And that house can become sustainable, but also end up selling electricity back right. to the company. Mm -hmm. You know, so so there's things like that. So I, I know I saw something the other day where I think um, Pennsylvania is still offering grants or, or, or Pico, which is our local um, electric company, is offering grants and, and they, they were showing um, uh, solar panels on a row home in Philadelphia. And, and how that there's grants and different things to do mm -hmm. that. I mean, we don't have to be dependent on fossil fuel. So whether it's um, uh, residential use or commercial use, or even if you're a hobbyist, like you talked about drones, for example, earlier, that there's going to be a need for drone technicians. And that there's certain films that you could put on top of the drone where the whole top of the drone is a solar panel mm -hmm. powering the drone and feeding the battery right. and so you have a more sustainable uh footprint so so the jobs are almost limitless i think sometimes that um because people don't have an understanding and and i think sometimes people are scared about change and so these are actually jobs that don't put you in harm's way like coal coal mm -hmm. was very important to our country but a yeah. lot of cancer, a lot of accidents. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, but with, with the sun, I mean, it, it changes in, in terms of what we could do. Same thing with wind. Yeah. You know, one, one of the things I did with my parents, and I, I was so blessed to be able to do this, I actually took a train ride across the country in 1984. And just to see the vast amount of land that's in America, and just think about if, if we put enough wind turbines in certain strategic places, you know, within the jet stream of the United States and North America, 
we can have sustainable energy. So mm -hmm. somebody has to build a turbine. Somebody has to fabricate the metal for building the turbine. Somebody has to program. There's so many jobs, whether you're putting in a solar array for a house or turbines, that, you know, that is something that can really change our economy. I'm hoping within the next year that there is some sort of big um, infrastructure plan mm -hmm. um, that includes the rebuilding of our highways, our bridges and things like that. Could you imagine the Walt Whitman Bridge or the Golden Gate Bridge with uh, like solar panels on the outside of it? Or, or 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 something like that. So instead of just you know instead of just being used just for transportation, is actually conducting energy, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it help feeding the city and things of that nature. And and you could actually take that whole industry and put it in all kinds of different environments, not just let's let's say um, on airplanes, mm -hmm. on, on boats. You just go on and on. Well, one of the things I wanted to point out is that not everyone in this in these industries that we're talking about, solar and wind, have college degrees. Right. There are technicians that put the solar panels up, that maintain the systems. There are technicians that follow through on making sure that they're monitoring the energy and, and checking on um, whether things are operating in the right way. They come back to the home and they inspect them. So there's all kinds of jobs. Um, in the design of the, the panels themselves, you might have some scientists that are doing that, the silicone that's in them and the, the engineers designing the, the connections for the electricity and so forth. So you have different people from different parts of the industry putting these units together and making them happen. And then people coming out to the homes to install them. And then from a political side of things, having to get your state to then invest in allowing people to get these things in their homes as a source of energy. Um, well, one of the things that we talked about our podcast on Spotify, mm -hmm. um, the mechanical engineering technician. Mm -hmm. so, so the engineer comes up with the plans, but as the mechanical engineering technician, it actually builds it because they, they may have to develop a new tool and things like that to actually put it together to de you know develop a new circuit or something like that or know how to weld the circuit to get the right energy flow and current through it to make it actually work mm -hmm. so you go all the way from maybe a degree certificate and two-year associate's program to a bachelor's master's and doctoral so it runs the gamut in terms of education yes yes and and it spills over into our our daily experiences as well. And one of those areas that it spills over into is the environment in terms of pollution. Um, and environmental safety is a job. Like if you hear, you wake up in the morning and there's an announcement about, it's a really bad day uh, for those of you who have asthma and so forth. Uh, there are people who are trying to help to ensure that the smokestacks that are in industries, they're not putting out as much pollution. There, there are people that are enacting policies that ensure that there's controls over what can be put into our rivers and in our streams and in the ocean. There are jobs all around those industries and those who go out to do the inspections and those who are creating different things to protect our environment. That's the whole industry within itself. So I, I think one of the things that we have to do, um, and I think this would alleviate some of the fears, uh, we have to expand post-secondary opportunity because there are large swaths of this country mm -hmm. where people do not have uh, opportunity for training. So, so if you think about the, some of the factories, whether it's a refrigeration factory, washing machines or something like that, you know, where, where you have skilled, trained workers that may be in their 30s or 40s, we have to develop programs and modalities to help them move to maybe developing a wind turbine or, or things of that nature. If people really um, want to see an economic turnaround in this country, 
where we're less dependent on foreign nations and we wanna see things made in America, we have to make an investment into post-secondary education. And I'm not just talking college, like I said, degree programs, associate programs, because high schools, there's not enough career technical education programs in the high school setting to offer a trained workforce to do what's needed to be done at this point. Yeah, yeah, and and um, that's gonna be a critical problem in the future because we're gonna have a, a lot of people that all retire at the same time. I mean, I'm, I'm maybe 10 years away from that, but the 10 years is eventually gonna happen. And mm -hmm. we don't have, we're not, actually families aren't having enough children to even fill in where we're gonna need it. And then on top of that, not enough for our children in the United States go into the technical fields. So that gives us another shortage. That That is in fact why uh, very often uh, companies are bringing people from other countries into the United States because they, they, they can't find enough, enough technical um, skilled people in this country. For example, in the state of Pennsylvania, there's over 200,000 computer science jobs that are available going unfilled because we don't have the people trained to do those kinds of jobs. And so mm -hmm. we need to take this, that's why we're having STEM forward because we wanna make this revelation available to all of you that there is many, many different types of opportunities out there. And we want parents exploring this with their children, having these conversations, asking questions like how did, you know, how does, um, you know, how did this situation get the way it is in terms of the environment in our community? What can we do to change our community as we see um, different types of, of problems that exist in our community? Um, one of the things that, especially as we talk about uh, African-American communities often are put in places where they're near chemicals, they're near unsafe places. How can we be a part of the industry that's gonna change that? How can we be a part of uh, ending the policies that allow that to happen in and near our communities. Those are the things that we have to think about when we talk about saving the planet. We have to also talk about saving our community and where we live daily. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you know where it starts, Steve? We need more black and brown teachers in K-12. to mm. that, that, That's something that's not really talked about. The percentage of black and brown teachers in K-12 to is really small. And then to go even further, math teachers, science teachers, certified, certified to teach algebra, certified to teach chemistry, certified to teach biology, to teach these classes. Because one of the things, when, when you look at some of the statistics, when black and brown children have encounters with black and brown teachers, the success rate goes up. Right. Because it, it, it's hard to succeed in math succeed in science if you don't see black people succeeding in that. I mean, for me, it was different because I had doctors and engineers in my family. Right. So I knew it was possible. You know, me wanting to get a science degree. Okay. My, my uncles did that. Mm -hmm. You know, my cousin did that. So, so that was not something new because I think I, I was fortunate when I came up, I had two black, when I had one black science teacher and I had one black math teacher in my K to 12 experience. But I will say in the programs I was involved in after school in the summer, um, they were more diverse, mm -hmm. you know, um, especially I, I got to work with uh, black undergraduate students in science. You know, so that was like, wow, they, you know, they were closer to my age. They were like 20, I was 15 or something like that. It's like, okay, they're majoring in that. I could do that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So role modeling is so important. And I want to encourage those out there who are teachers right now, that if you, once we get back to our classes, I know many of us are online, but you can still do this online, actually, invite professionals who are in different fields more frequently. And you may do it now, but add, add different opportunities for professionals to come to your class so that people, so that this young people can see that the education that they're getting is gonna to lead to an opportunity. It's not happening in a vacuum. They want to, they want to see that there's someone that's in medicine, 
that looks like them that's interested in medicine. They want to see that there's someone in the finance industry. They want to see that there's someone in the manufacturing industry. In all those industries, I know that I'm putting students out into these industries. They still may be one of very few, but they are out there and that you can pursue them to come and actually speak to your students. It can make a difference. You never know what child is sitting in your class and no one's ever said to them, wow, you know, you love math. This is what you can do with it. And just by them having it, one or two people come and have that conversation, they see that there's a possibility for them. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, parents, don't don't leave it up to your school. You know the the first teacher, the best teacher are the parents. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you, you have to take it upon yourself um, to find opportunity for your child to advocate for your child. Um, ask questions around the school, but also be helpful. You know, ask the principal, you know, how, how can I help you? You know, what, what are some of the resources that maybe you need from the community and things like that? You know, try to develop a good relationship with your children's teacher, with your principal. And if you have opportunity through your employer or through your, your business that you could provide to the school that gives the school community and your child an opportunity, you know, take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Also, um, just like you found out about summer, pro your parents found out about summer programs, just mm -hmm. a strategy for doing that call the dean's department at your particular at colleges in your area We're, and here in, in philadelphia we have university of penn and temple and drexel and villanova and all these different universities if you call the department they can tell you whether they have stem programs that you can have your child participate in and all of us are actually doing it but not everyone is actually applying to our program. So I wanna encourage you as a parent, if you have that young child that's really interested to make sure that you have these questions um, answered. And now it is never too early to begin to find out. In fact, the program that I do called Vested, um, it's a deadline is Sunday. Um, we're actually accepting applications right now for something that we're gonna do next semester. And there are many, many programs like this going on throughout the city that if you do some research in your school district, talk with uh, those in the science department in your school district to find out if things are there. Ask your counselors if there are programs that are coming across their desk to keep you in mind or periodically check with them. So there are opportunities, but we need you to fill the seats. We need you to be part of the process and part of the exposure to these various scientific opportunities. And we need you to be a part of saving the planet. A lot of, a lot of um, great inventions have come from the diversity of scientists and engineers that work together as a team. We're sending our, actually it's a, a black astronaut that's going out into space. One of the first uh, astronauts to actually hang out there for a while. Um, so we're having that experience and that's gonna be another role model that we'll get to see. But look for opportunities, not only to talk about the dead people who are doing science and technology, talk about the live people. Look for the live people who are engaged in it that can keep your children enthusiastic about it as well. And one of the ways you can do what Dr. Jones was talking about, uh, many library systems, whether in your city, county, uh, or borough, um, offer online resources that, that you can have access to periodicals, books, audio books, videos, mm -hmm. and things of that nature. So the, the, the library is still a great resource, you know, beyond the internet, because you, you have to go through the deluge of, of, you know, less reputable resources on the internet. So the library is still king. Mm -hmm. Uh, another th another experience that you can have in this whole environmental area is when your child goes to college, there are opportunities in the summer to actually do research on a college campus. And you can do research in the labs uh, on the college campus. I know our, on our campus, we will pay for your housing and you'll get a stipend while you're working with a researcher on the college campus. I think that that's a phenomenal opportunity or you can go out into industry and work in industry um, for 10 weeks and actually get paid enough to, to provide for your housing and get a wonderful experience 
and industry is never um, never enough of the kinds of exposures that you can have while you're in college. And you can do two or three different types of experiences. And then I found that students, by having some of these research experiences, consider going further for their master's and their doctorate degree because they've had the, the different types of exposures. And one of the things I'll say to parents along those lines, I know many people are in the high school selection process at this point, that even though you want your child to go to college, do not shy away from career and technical education because it doesn't mean that they're not going to college, but they can really gain some hands-on valuable experience that will make them very competitive you know, once they get there. Mm -hmm. And community colleges have a lot of different types of programs that some of the four-year colleges don't even have. Some of the technical training programs in medicine, um, they have them and uh, different types of, of manufacturing, um, they, they have them. So don't leave out the community college. You can actually go there a lot cheaper than paying for the four-year <laughs> college up front and then transfer in. They have these agreements now where you spend two years at a certain community college, like Community College of Philadelphia, and then you automatically carry all of your credits into Temple and then you finish out or into Penn or into you know, Villanova. You, you get that opportunity to, to make the transition. So don't see it as um, a bad opportunity. And sometimes young people actually, even though they have a passion for science technology, they need the two year experience before you invest thousands upon thousands of dollars at that four year curriculum. You wanna make sure they have adjustment and the community colleges have a lot more math at different levels than the four year colleges. Really a lot of the four year colleges just say, you're going into calculus or you're going into the, whatever your main math is. There are no math levels before that so that you can adjust to it. So again, community college might give your child that opportunity to do that adjustment. So you're not telling them no, but you're selling them, yes, get the most preparation that you possibly can so that you can be successful. You know, one of the things I love about um, doing this live stream every month, Steve, you, you never know who's going to be on. Actually, one of my organic chemistry study buddies is actually watching right mm -hmm. now. Awesome. So I just want to give them a shout out. Awesome. Um, so it's almost that time, Steve. Yes. You know, the, the hour goes real fast. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I hope that you've gotten some really good points. Uh, we really want to maximize our children's education, both at the K-12 experience and post-secondary. And as we said, I want to make sure that you heard that we did say not every child is going to go to college, but they can go into different types of fields. And we, we have a podcast that we share all the that we share all the time now to talk about those opportunities as well. So we want you to stay engaged with us. Uh, send us questions and we have our information available. Um, we both have websites that you can go into and we want to be a resource to you and to your school to make a difference in the lives of your children. So one of the things you could do to follow us, check out stemforward.edu. I mean, stemforwardedu.org. Like Steve said, you could drop us a line. You can join our website. You can ask us questions. You can also check us out on Spotify or your favorite podcast um, application. Just search for STEM Ford. And I actually have on Facebook, um, college, and I have a page called College and Career Access. So you can find me there as well. Okay, great. So here's, here's Steve's website, uh, drstephenjones.net. He also has books for studying scholarships. Uh, we also have a couple online courses uh, for parents and for students, but check us out at stemfordedu.org. Awesome. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be back next month. Join us then. See you then.